Okay, there, all right. Then afterwards, you can just, um, well, this, you can just go and stop it. Just click on stop, and then you can click, go click on file, and then just say save. Uh, export movie. I'm just going to write that down. You know, that, that's just Let me write it somewhere where I have You can just ask yourself all sorts of <laughs> You can do this. <sighs> All the best. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good morning. Well, at least, at least some of you guys made it for 9 o'clock. <laughs> How is everybody doing? Uh, it's 9 o'clock. It's, it's like coming to work in the middle of the night for me. So. So I'm, I'm a night person, so when I have to be here, it's like... I try, I try to wake up early, and then I think, you know, shame. I'm going to be half asleep here. So in case um, that on top of being pregnant and everything, like my conversation I'm hoping is not completely incoherent. So if you don't understand something, you can politely ignore it and ask me afterwards, and I hope I'll be able to pick something together. Now, if you have questions, please ask and interrupt as we go. All right. Um, it's 9.02. I'm going to start now. Um, otherwise, we end up waiting for too long. And then, if you like, you like. All right. Everybody, welcome. And uh, say I, I hope you have a good morning. Glad to see you in the uh, Today, our session is going to uh, basically carry on from what Dr. Nika had introduced. Uh, what was that? Last week, Wednesday. Yeah. Sorry, let me just check and see that our recording device is on. Maybe. So my guys. Got it. Okay. Um, so basically, uh, in the previous, what we're doing today is continuing on resilience and vulnerability. Um, last week we we talked about basically kind of reintroducing some of the key concepts um, and the theories be of vulnerability and resilience, particularly within the context of disaster risk reduction. Right? Um, we talked about the fact that vulnerability does not just there's not one widely accepted definition. It is not something that everybody in the field just says well. You see that's vulnerability. This is what it is. This is what it's going to look like. Okay, um, and the same with resilience. We also brought up the question: Is resilience the opposite of vulnerability? Are the two interchangeable? If you are one, does that mean that you are not the other? Okay. Um, we also um, talked a little bit about elements of adaptation and where that comes into play. Now, this time we're going to look at specifically issues around methodology and practice, which um, I'm hoping that, has everybody now just been able to, they've been um, set up on Ifundi and Penzu, so everybody should have handed in their first assignment. Okay, no problem, besides those who communicated their problems to us already. Okay, um, so basically, um, one of the articles that was registered in your um, your unit folder for this, this particular section um, was an article that talked about vulnerability versus resilience, and we looked at concepts, methodology, and practice. So I believe that article is by Miller. Right? So hopefully you've all read that, because that is the foundation of our discussion today. And within methodology and practice, the reason why it's so significant, we need to understand what the concepts are. So obviously that's our starting point. And then we go into methodology, um, because ultimately it's now, 
how did this how does this get um, how does this actually kind of move from concepts into something else? And then the practice is the reality. Okay. When we talk about methodology, we look very much at the the way that you um, you're able to use the concepts. Okay. Um, when we talk about methodology and research, what do we talk about? What are we referring to? What does methodology mean? Oh, that's what I'm feeling too. What does methodology mean? <laughs> And that's pretty much what it is here. It's the way in which you're going to go about getting something. Okay? Now, in this context, when we look at vulnerability and we look at resilience, one of the things that is brought up is the fact that they promote the use of hybrid or mixed methodologies. Okay? That's our first argument. That instead of using one particular method, and this is how it is. And this is what exactly, if you, you have to walk down this street and turn left at the corner, it's not so clear cut. All right? And that goes back to the nature of the two concepts itself. All right? Resilience and vulnerability. We've just established last week that they're not cut and dry. There's no one accepted definition. So we need to be able to have a methodology that is equally as flexible. Okay? And to, and to be able to... Um, account for the, the nuances within the information that we're trying to gather, all right? So when we say this, we suggest that there's a, a pluris, gosh, here, here's my, my pronunciation today, a pluris approach, all right? So we're looking at utilizing multiple ways of collecting data, all right? In particular, some of the ways that we've used, we've looked at participatory action research, um, I don't know if if you guys are familiar with this, are you familiar with that methodology? Okay, basically, um, now that's, this is just the one thing I can talk about when we get to that. Um, that's, it's when you actually, in, instead of going into a community or going into a particular setting and saying, we're gonna survey you, we're going to, basically the researcher comes in as a researcher and kind of, in my mind, would extract information from the population. Okay, or the particular group that you're targeting. All right, so me, researcher, you group, I take from you. You basically give information to me, I use that information. Participatory action research, on the other hand, is a method that we've been trying, and I've been trying with my own work. Um, it's not necessarily where the researcher is the person who stands there and tells you what, what he needs or she needs. All right, it's actually where you go in and it's more of a, I would like to actually say, it's a little more practical in the sense of when you go in, you start down a particular pathway and as the group that you're dealing with, as information comes or particular you know, viewpoints come up, the research now bends to, to fit around that, okay? So in the end, what it, how it actually is, if you want to look at it this way, it's that the group itself, they become the researchers, and the researcher actually becomes the observer. All right? And it's not just a something where you just, you know, you tell people, and, you know, this is what I want, you must give it to me. They now, the group that you're dealing with, they now start to give insight and input, and they actually, in, um, it's what we tend to do it a lot in community research and community work, that the groups themselves now start to contribute and they start to see some of the, the what you're looking for and now they may realize that hey you know what say for example um, this particular system this is how it works now they may realize that you know this isn't actually working I think maybe we should look at it a different way even within a community structure if you want to get X done, you must talk to Y, but you can't talk to Y until you talk to, to Z. And we're like, that's not actually working for me. So how can we do this differently? 
And then they actually now put this into practice, okay? And to, to see, is this working? Okay, well, we thought it would work. No, it doesn't work, so let's change it again. But it's not the researcher telling the group to do it. It's the group leading itself, okay? And you become the observer, and you document what they're doing, right? Um, we've got multi-agent models, which looks pretty much at a target group, okay? And how that target group, whether it be an individual or a particular community or so on, how they specifically function in a context, okay? And it is led by the focus on them, or it can be, I mean, as broad as, as you name it, um, but it can also be very narrow, okay? So you can look at how um, Sutu men um, utilize water catchments in Limpopo, or you can look at, in this particular community, members of the ZCC church and their how their religious beliefs contribute to vulnerability, okay? Um, you also have participatory assessments and mappings. Um, I think some of that we'll go, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit, a little further down in the, in the course when we talk about disaster risk assessments. Um, it's very similar, but ultimately, again, it goes along with the participatory action research that it is no longer the case of a researcher coming in, extracting information, and walking out the door with that, all right? It's really getting the community involved and getting their input and their vision and their viewpoints, and then seeing how they can now use that, giving them the power in the situation. Okay. Uh, and scenario planning, um, I think that's also one of your courses in this, this section, I'm not sure which unit it comes in, or if it's a unit in and of itself, but um, Michael Murphy, I believe, will be teaching you that. Okay, so that you can discuss. But ultimately, what it is, is looking at, it's not creating the impossible scenario, and then figuring out, well, what are you gonna do, and A, B, C, D, and marking it out, but it's, it's ultimately designed to get people to think. To get people to think beyond what they're, Current situation is and to is a way of understanding different scenarios and to get them to understand how if this happens this is how we could react it's not necessarily to say I think a lot of people especially uh, people that work in disaster management fire safety um, it's it's not necessarily the same as a lot of people assume it's like contingency planning if this if, if a train crashes on this street and dumps this chemical this is ABC, what we're going to do, okay? It's not necessarily that stringent. It's, it's not that tied down, right? It's more generalized, and it's, again, to give you direction and to get you to think of all the, the considerations that really have to be made, okay? And one of the advantages of the hybrid and the mixed methodology approach is not only do we, we use some of these, these specific activities, but one of the things that we really look at is integrating both quantitative and qualitative. Um, I believe you guys are doing a research methodology course. I think it's, it's is it next semester? This semester. this semester. Okay, you've started it now? Okay. Anyway, um, in that course, one of the things that, um, in your, your assignment, one of the things, and for our M students as well, um, I'm not sure. People, when you say quantitative, now it might be different because this group actually has a few more scientists in it, but usually in the master's group that we have, as soon as you say quantitative research, it's like, oh God, no. Just like anything else, but don't make me do that. All right? People seem to hate quantitative methodologies. All right? And when we say quantitative versus qualitative, what we're ultimately talking about is the type of data that you collect and the methods, how you do it. Okay? Quantitative is a little more along the lines of, um, it's the numbers. It's something that you can, a little more positivist, how you can actually, um, if you do surveys, every single year, we're going to do qualitative research. What tools are you going to use? We're going to use surveys. Okay, contradiction right there. Um, there's this kind of that disconnect in the understanding that, um, well, what, what are you going to survey? Okay, okay, we can do surveys. What are you going to survey? Um, say in this room, I'm going to survey 
you six people. Okay, all right. Um, when we talk about surveys, we talk about a larger population, and we talk about, obviously, when you do a survey, you need to get information that is representative of the sample that you need, okay? So you can't just be like, I'm going to survey two people, and that's going to give me all the information I need, and I can make a general statement about all of the students at the class doing post-grad courses, okay? So it works very much on scale, and whereas qualitative is more on the, the richness of the data, okay? And for most of your research, it will probably be based on qualitative, um, not exclusively, but primarily just because of, um, like for the, the assignments you're going to do, just because of the, the amount of time you have, okay? For our ends, that's usually what we do. Instead of them designing like a questionnaire to serve like 7,000 people across South Africa, the time just isn't there. It is possible, I guess, but it would just be really difficult. So a lot of our methodologies are based on qualitative research. We look at interviews, we look at focus groups. Okay? So within this now, when we talk about quanti quantitative research and the benefits of both, we incorporate methods like surveys, um, knowledge elic elicitation tools, and other participatory tools. But again, that is tied down to, I don't say tied specifically to numbers, but it's, it's really pinned down more to scale, right? So you could do 100 interviews, you could do 100 surveys. It's not necessarily the same when you write it up, right? Because when you analyze quantitative data, you do tend to go more, um, in my M, I did both, and I did I did surveys as well as interviews and focus groups. But one of the things we realized was how you analyze that data. I'm looking at statistics. If you don't like statistics, stay away from surveys. Um, we had to do the, the programs that we used. It was more complex in terms of numbers. Whereas when we did, I did the qualitative um, methodology, it was a lot easier in, in terms of you had to pay more attention to what was being said. You had to go through interview transcripts word by word because it wasn't that you were going to necessarily look for 10 people all said the exact same thing word for word. All right, and that's how you get your, your, your data. Okay, it's like, oh well, they, everybody agreed on this. Everybody agreed on this, but they maybe, they agreed with certain conditions or after prompting from the group, then they agreed, all right? So it's the nature in which that data comes across as well as what it's saying, okay? And we get our qualitative data through focus groups, through interviews and other participatory techniques, okay? Well, why hybrid design? Why, why can't we just use quantitative? Why can't? Why is it just not really a, a great option for looking at resilience and vulnerability? And our argument is that if you use one method, because of, because of the nature, again, of the concept, you would be losing so much information. If I just did statistics, if I did surveys that captured quantitative data in terms of the numbers and the percentages, I would be losing out on other very rich data, okay? Um, for example, we've just been doing research with uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and part of the data now is looking at how, uh, you know, we, the number of detailed surveys that so, in, so many people participated in, the statistics behind it, and so on. But they also did focus groups to balance it. Okay, so the main numbers we got from the surveys, but the focus groups and we're now able to give the details behind. Oh, okay, uh, I think Diavolt had given an example last time, um, but for example, you know, everybody agrees that, you know, if, if they were asked, yes, we like water pumps. Water pumps are good for a community. Okay. <clears throat> However, when you go and you delve further into that, into that response, you also get, Yes, they're really good, but the older ladies get are tired using it. 
that they they don't it, it's good for the water aspect of it that we don't have to you know walk 10 miles to a river but realistically it's not the most practical option okay so that now changes the how you perceive the quantitative data that you just got where everybody says yeah this is really great 100% of a community likes water pumps but it is now backed by they like the idea of not having to walk so far but realistically it's not the most practical option because of who's using it and then the quant the qualitative data is also really helpful in the context to help you come up with solutions they just said now in this information that it's older ladies that use these pumps so you either need to get younger people trained on how to use water pumps which that now is a cultural issue so that's not as easy to change so what can we do change the particular type of pump not only do they have the step pumps they also have pumps with um, you know ones like the old-fashioned ones where you just use your arm okay you lift up the valve and it uh, back and forth back and forth for like two hours maybe that's an option maybe the women in rural Malawi have stronger arms okay um, or if they really want to come up with something different they also have a new pump that they've been designing and it's um, I don't know what you call it here uh, it's it's like a, a round circular thing and you hold on to it little kids hold on to it and they run and then you jump on and it kind of spins you around this is a water pump design that they have come up with and they they're actually implementing it in parts of Africa now so the more they put it in schoolyards so that kids at school have something to play on and while they're playing gallons and gallons of water are being pumped up for the schools and for the communities and it's being divested through a series of pipes okay maybe that might have been a better option but you wouldn't have necessarily known that specifically from certain questions okay and with quantitative research because you go in like with a survey um, it's very fixed okay the questions you ask you're, you're not necessarily in a position to say um, oh yeah well by the way can you tell me more on that it's the nature of surveys it's it's not a flexible tool whereas focus groups they do have a little more opportunity to ask questions and prompt okay so by having different perspectives being taken into account by yes you've got the numbers and the numbers are important and we're not saying that they're not but by incorporating those numbers and then balancing them with the insight from the people themselves you're more likely to get an accurate representation of the viewpoint of the vulnerable people in the community okay a lot of times too we as researchers go in and we you kind of you feel that you know you really you feel that you know like what we were saying in the last class as well well if you're poor you're vulnerable uh, we have a comment somewhere from this side so that sometimes it's not the assumption that poor people are going to be the most affected and they are the most vulnerable I came to South Africa and <coughs> it was nearly six years ago and um, you know things that things that make you think okay it was at the time when ESCOM was experimenting with lots and lots of power pets I was staying in Mignonette and I was staying in the second second floor of a, of a flat now of course everything is electric it was gone for the whole weekend now can you look at the context here people are assuming that because you're poor you're more vulnerable well I know that most of the people in the township that night Friday night Saturday night and up to Sunday afternoon they were more likely able to boil water and cook dinner I had no vehicle and all across the friendly all that stuff everything was shut down because they had no power most of them didn't have backup generators so to get cooked food I'm sitting there I'm eating crackers for three days and I emptied out the fridge and it was just like yeah this is not working but when you look at the resources sometimes a different demographic like people that might be not as poor or wealthier might be equally vulnerable because they may be more vulnerable to uh, heat stroke in certain circumstances because their houses are not designed for power cuts because they have air conditioning units and big beautiful fans and so when power goes off in the middle of New York City in the summer 
you may not want to be sitting in that house. Versus if you have a house that's that's open, and it might be open because you know some of the roof is missing, but realistically, you might be more able to to deal with that situation. Okay. So um, also in assume being able to identify multi, the different perspectives of vulnerable persons, but to be able to identify who those vulnerable people actually are, not necessarily just based on your observation, but what they actually say. Uh, a colleague and I, we did a book chapter, and she grew up in rural Zimbabwe, and we had this big debate. We were doing kind of the perspective of social vulnerability, looking at you know, rural communities. And outwardly, the argument is, is that no, vulnerable communities are more vulnerable. Rural communities are more vulnerable than urban communities. And she actually argued that that's not necessarily true. Because in some rural communities, the, in the social networks, the social structures that they have, if I don't have food in my house right now, and I don't have money. I don't even know my neighbors. Okay, I, I, I see them come in and out, but it's like, hi, hi. Okay. I don't know that. I would never feel in a position where I could be like, hey, I have absolutely nothing to eat. Can I borrow some bread? Social perspective, social beliefs, cultural practices. Okay, I would just be too damn ashamed to go over there and ask for bread and, you know, some sugar. You know, it just, that's just how the culture that I grew up in, that's just how it is, right? Versus in a rural community, if you don't have, it's, it's just natural. Everybody knows everybody else. And there's also, I think, a stronger safety net for people if people get sick. Because my neighbor doesn't know necessarily what I do, <laughs> we have the big joke where I live. The house um, on the left-hand side there's an older, I believe there is an older couple that lives there. Well, for about four weeks, all of the curtains were taken down in the house. And it, the way their house is, you can't really see it from the road, you can see it from our yard. And I just said, you know, that I assume that there's an older couple in there because there's a name plate with their name and their telephone number on it on the gate. I actually don't think I've ever seen a lady in that house. I don't think I've ever seen a, the older lady come in and out. I've seen that there's a, like a, I guess a daughter. I said, you know that that woman could be dead and rotten in that house? And I, again, she, she could be there from now until her kid comes over to visit. But I, I don't know, you know? And I thought, where I grew up in Jamaica, the whole neighborhood, I will say, the whole neighborhood knows my family. And if you're not in the bank on a Friday morning, by 10 o'clock, people start to call my mother. What's going on? Because in that generation of people, that's what you do. You go to the bank. You sit in the air conditioning because it's 900 degrees. You sit in the air conditioning. You take a number. You're like number 287, and they're at three. And you sit there, and you it's all the retired people. So a lot of them have worked abroad and lived abroad, and they all come back. And they all sit in this big bank of chairs, and they all chat. And it's what the grandchildren are doing, and my son is doing this, and I'm going here, and you know I had hip surgery, and my husband's having bypass surgery. And that's what it is, and that's their social network. Uh, and that's a rural area. But as you say here, dude, if I didn't show up for work for a few days, I can't even say that even at work that they would notice because it'd be like, oh, she must be working from home, no big deal. So it's it's how things are perceived and how, how your community is structured. So again, and I was very surprised when she said this. I'm like, how could you even think of that? I mean, really? Don't you think that rural communities, because of the lack of resources and infrastructure, that they definitely would have to be way more vulnerable. And she came up with some interesting points to counter that. And again, the social networks, but also the fact that a lot of people when they, in families, when they, they migrate from rural areas to urban areas for work, that they have no social structure. 
So they have a severe dependence on the rural, their rural homelands. Okay? Those family members at home end up having to now send money to take care of the people in the urban areas until they get on their feet and they get established. Okay? So it was just a very a different perspective of what I was than what I was anticipating because I figured, yeah. well, gee, you know, when you put it that way, it does make sense. Okay. So that's why we look at hybrids. Okay, because it obviously now is being able to get more information and to fill in those blanks so that we're not making assumptions. Okay. Um, another aspect, again, is you can go back and look at that article. Um, the fact that within resilience and vulnerability, there's similar themes, and they, but they still ask different questions. Okay. I just wanted to quickly ask, who's read that article? Article by Wilson, I believe in your package. I believe Prof. Niekerk said that last week when she was done your reading, she was kind of an exception to the rule. And this article here, in Ecology and Society, Resilience and Vulnerability, Complementary or Conflicting Concepts. Fiona Miller, Aspar Boyd, Gamalia, blah, 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 blah. Who read the article? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good, good. Anyone else? I can see that. <laughs> I, I, I put highlights on mine, so just to prove that I, I read mine as well. At least the part where there's the highlights. All right. Basically, in this example, uh, in this article, sorry, they gave two. They gave a particular example. All right, and in that example, it was within context of Limpopo, which I thought was quite interesting because a lot of times you get the articles and the articles are based, especially since most of the authors are, um, they're not South African, not from the continent. Um, the fact that they put an example from the Limpopo region, I thought was quite interesting. And I wanted to just very quickly um, to discuss the two perspectives. Okay, so if you have this article, could you pull it out, please? If you have it on your computer, this might be a good time to pop it out on your desk. I want to know the two perspectives. Okay, because the argument is basically saying that in this one particular area, in this one particular study, they looked at vulnerability and resilience. Okay, and it's on page number somewhere. Falls within the heading. Similar themes, yet different questions. Okay. Can anybody tell me what the themes were? What they, how they actually, the two viewpoints. What was the vulnerability angle that they took? Okay, all right, it's going to be a very long class. All right, the vulnerability angle that they took. When we ask you to read, we ask you to read for a reason because we're going to be bringing things like this up. And I personally, I will do this in my lectures. All right? So be up for warm. Basically, the vulnerability approach that they took, they were looking at specifically different stakeholders, okay? So their, their focus was on a particular unit, and the unit was stakeholders in this little area in Limpopo, okay? And they wanted to view um, how, the, how the stakeholders themselves, how they perceived their own vulnerability, okay? So basically asked, in this context, if you were the stakeholders, tell me, in your context, are you vulnerable? If you are vulnerable, what are you vulnerable? How do you how do you explain it? Tell me why. Okay, and they particularly they ask those questions. Uh, one of the things that will come up probably throughout the the rest of the this particular course is 
also risk perception, and it goes a lot to vulnerability. And it goes back to, well, if you ask certain people, are you vulnerable? I'm not vulnerable, why would I be vulnerable? Okay? I live in a concrete house and I have a job and whatever. How many people, if they, in this room, that those are working, if they missed one paycheck, if something happened, one paycheck, they could lose their house or they could be severely behind on payments. Two paychecks, they're now in arrears. Okay, that means they cannot pay their cell phone, which is their, not necessarily the flash of carrying a Blackberry or an iPhone, but that is their communication. They cannot afford the home internet. They can no longer afford to pay for their, their petrol or their car payments. Okay? And those people now will be scrambling to try and cover the, cover the difference. Okay? This is actually the problem that happened in America that led to the um, economic downfall. Because this is how many Americans live. If you look on television and you see most Americans live based off of, they, put, they basically put things on their <coughs> cards. Okay? So when, they, when people would lose jobs, when things like that would happen, and they lost income, they couldn't make the payment. Or they would use this credit card to pay off that credit card, right? Because their car payment, their cell phone payment, their child's, you know, origami lessons, they were all put on credit cards. People didn't necessarily have savings, right? So having savings was their cushion, right? But if you ask people in the States now, in those situations, do you feel vulnerable? Now, ask somebody who's living in you know, a five-bedroom house and drive, family has two cars, children in private school. Do you feel vulnerable? They would say no. Look at people in poorer communities. If they miss a paycheck, are they going to die? Well, have to, there's a lot of people that don't have paychecks to miss, and they are still able to function. Okay? They, they, may not, they may not necessarily have the same access as somebody, you know, who, the family that has the two, you know, BMWs with personalized license plates, but they are able to at least maintain where they live. They're able to provide basic food. They're able to continue a basic existence. So the shock in terms of um, who would be more vulnerable, more vulnerable in that situation I would actually say the richer families, right? Even though the assumption would be no, but they have, they've got more money. So if something happens, they should be able to last longer or do whatever, or they have insurance on their home. If you don't have, if you miss a payment in insurance, it changes the dynamics of what they'll cover, right? So if you don't pay your insurance for six months because you're paying for, you know, you, you really need a new manicured nails. So instead of paying for insurance, you paid and your nails is really great. So if your house burns down, having insurance, having technically having insurance doesn't help. Okay? So putting in, just to, to kind of give you a different viewpoint. Okay. Now the second perspective um, they also used a mixed method approach. They used qualitative and quantitative data. Um, but now, in the resilience angle, they wanted, instead now of just focusing on those particular stakeholders in that scenario, they actually wanted to look at the entire system. Okay? So within the system's context, they wanted to know how it functioned. And they looked at a particular subcatchment area. Okay? So they did the examination of how this particular scenario um, played out. All right? I just want you guys, um, I'm not going to go through the whole big thing in details, but I want you guys to actually read this, just to see the differences. It's the difference in how you ask your question and how you focus your, your study. Okay? Um, and to understand that even though they're technically looking at similar, similar broad topics, um, the way they're focusing it 
obviously changes what exactly they're getting from it. Okay. Um, scales of analysis is another, is another aspect that they use to actually um, differentiate between vulnerability and resilience. They look at um, particularly short, um, long and short term. Okay? And they're looking at, from the resilience perspective, on one hand, they want to look at longer term. Okay? Resilience tends to focus not on what's happening just here now, and let's, let's get this big picture and out of there. They want to look at the longer term, the slower changes, particularly when we talk about climate change. That tends to fall within, the, within resilience. Okay, what are the drivers of change? Whereas, alternatively, vulnerability tends to look at human agency. It tends to look at what people can do, what people can't do. What access do they have? What resources do they are they able to, to draw on? Okay. And they also look at particular hazards. But it's within a very short period of time. Okay. We mentioned on the first day that vulnerability, it changes. Okay? It is linked to time and space. Vulnerability at this moment in this room with this group of people will be different than, say, if we come back in 10 years, the same group of people in the same room. Okay? So the scale of analysis, long-term versus short-term, it's another factor that, we, that differentiates between them. Okay? Social and economic ecological dynamics and feedback. God, I hate slideshows. Does anyone else just really hate slideshow presentations? It's just me. Sorry, I much, prefer, I much prefer interactive, but it's like, gosh, I got stuck with the theory. Anyway, um, it's, it's getting better. <coughs> just let me get to the end. It might be all right. Um, social and eco ecological dynamics and feedbacks. Um, this now, again, looks at the importance of looking at different levels of analysis. It is local versus national or regional. We are looking at, say, catchments versus small-scale farms or looking at river ecosystems. In the Limpopo study, they looked at a subcatchment, which apparently is different than a catchment. <laughs> Watersheds versus plateaus versus so on, okay? So looking at the different, the, the actual particulars of an, of an area, all right? And how, what the dynamics are in that, all right? Um, and the other thing that's really interesting is how, they, how they, they kind of, when they look at feedback, there is um, a way that they kind of have thresholds, they call them. And thresholds ultimately, it's ultimately a way of setting kind of a, like parameters, okay? So when we say parameters, I mean, um, how do you know when, when climate change is bad? How do you know? Okay, well, climate change, assuming you believe in the theory. Okay, say it's happening right now. Okay, how is it affecting us? Has it reached its... its critical mass. What has to happen before we all start to panic and, you know, pack up our houses and, you know, and run and try and hide in the hills somewhere? What is that critical point between what's happening and the worst case scenario? All right? How do, excuse me, how do we know that this is All right, is it that the temperature goes up? The temperature can go up two or three degrees over a span of, you know, five decades. But if it goes up six degrees, all hell is breaking loose. All right, now it's like we're all headless chickens and we're all running like mad. Okay, is that what the threshold is? Is the threshold when, um, you know, rainfall in this particular area over this period of time it no longer reaches that point. And now we've got to start making some important decisions. Okay? So within, um, within this category, what we look at, we tend to focus on the ecological dynamics. And when we look at that, again, we look at what are the things that we see? What are the little more, I'm going to say necessarily that it's always measurable, it's always visible, 
but it might be a little more obvious, okay? And it's based on when people can no, say for example, people can no longer access papaya in July in South Africa, particularly Limpopo. If you can't get papaya, that means something in terms of the climate change context, something has happened that is so significant that it has made a change that is great enough for us to take notice. So when we talk about thresholds, that's what we're looking at, right? And within that, now it's how do you determine those thresholds? Are we looking at the science or are we looking at judgment? Okay, we said people can't get papaya. What happens if dogs can access papaya? All the dogs in Limpopo suddenly give up meat, they decide to go vegan, and they have decided that papaya is their new thing. Okay, cows as well. If you're going to go, go for cows as well. Okay, that's what we are now looking at. How do you decide, how do we decide people? If, if all the cows and the dogs can access papaya, does that mean that we've met the threshold? Well, technically you said people. So then maybe, maybe not. We look at, is it, is it going to be measured quantitatively? Is it going to be based on science? Is it going to be based on judgment? Well, when I say people, yeah, I also met dogs and cows. Okay, the bigger, the broader sense of things. In general, you cannot access it. So it's not like you can go and wrestle a papaya from your dog and it's okay. okay? If you have to resort to wrestling an animal for fruit, then you know that you have a problem. Okay? So... Is it based on the science, or is it going to be based on your judgment? Crop outputs for this area should be, if they're under this amount, then this is what's going to happen. Or when I feel that I can no longer access this, I cannot go to the corner shop, I cannot go to the, the farm vendor on the side of the road and get papayas easily. Is that how we're going to decide? Okay. So looking at how, whether we're going to use hard science, whether we're going to use personal judgment, feelings, and values will also help determine our threshold. Okay. Vulnerability perspectives. How do, again, the Limpopo study was looking at how stakeholders view their vulnerability. Okay? We look at local priorities, and we're looking at quantitative, we're looking at qualitative, looking at agent-based models, for example. Okay, in that particular scenario. Um, I want you, I, I strategically put up pictures, okay? So this, these are two, and then we're gonna have a few more at the end, hopefully. Um, but I want you to keep this in mind. How the scale, the focus, right? What are we talking about, right? When we look at resilience perspectives, Again, going back to the Popo study, they looked at the overall system function. You see the difference between just some people versus an entire functioning system. Okay? Qualitative systems, the dynamics, and looking at vulnerability analysis are some of the ways that they pulled out. Okay? And again, looking at social and ecological systems and linking the drivers of those. Okay? Within the context of resilience, this, this I actually thought was, I'm, I'm actually a little more surprised that it didn't come up more in documentation. It was that clear. Um, basically, when we look at resilience, um, they want to investigate the interaction between longer term, slow changes, drivers of change, again like climate change, and rapid changes such as flooding, economic crises, etc. But they put it together really nicely. Um, and so I just kind of put it in a diagram because I'm a visual person and those words mean nothing to me. Looking at resilience. When we look at resilience, what, what does that actually say to us? Right? What should be the first thing that flash in our mind when we look at that term? Okay? That the ability to absorb shocks. Okay? That needs to be balanced with the ability to bounce back. One of the key things that it was touched on very briefly, but it's going to come up further in, it's 
not our section, but also some of the other units. Are you resilient if you build back? And some of the issues that we talk about in terms of um, if you build the same thing that you had before, is that is that rebuilding worthwhile? Is that rehabilitation worthwhile? Is it effective? Okay. So the factor that is most critical in this is not just the absorbing shock and the bouncing back. It's the ability to learn and to so to make changes, realize what happened, what went wrong, and now we need to go and fix that. Okay. So I think if, if nothing more, when you walk out of this room today, and the next one as well, okay. vulnerability now. Vulnerability. The reason why I had to give you the resilience one first was so that you could keep that in context. But when looking at vulnerability, again, we're both focusing on human agency. We're looking at people. Um, one of the KPs that came in, um, I, I think you should have been aware of it, the USAID knowledge products that the center has. Did Diabald mention that? No? Okay, great. We have knowledge products, which we call KPs, and they are available for free, access to anybody, whether you are students, staff, random people in the street, all you have to do is register and you get access to basically, give or take, they're about around 60 pages each uh, on various topics. There should be now at least 37 of them on various topics link, ranging everything from vulnerability, how to do disaster risk assessments, um, what is disaster risk reduction, um, climate change, climate change adaptation impacts, so on. And basically what these are, they're compilations by scholars and people in the field, practitioners, um, again, depending on the nature of what the topic is. And they're basically kind of the one-stop shop, like the unit, the summary of what that, what that encompasses, okay? So one of the things that, uh, one of the units that came in on vulnerability, it's one of the first things that I, I learned, and I learned because I, I was told how, how incorrect I was. There, so this document comes in and I have to, I've got to go and review it. And there is the most awesome picture in there. And it talks about vulnerability of a donkey. It is a great picture of a donkey though. When you saw it, it was just like, you felt sorry for the donkey. You could empathize. It had like no grass, you know, the head was down. It, was, it looked sorry, it looked wrong. And that the donkey was vulnerable to climate change. Like, you could, just, you could just see it. And vulnerable to hazards such as drought and war. And I just looked at that and I thought, oh, okay, let's go to the back of this one. So let's maybe clarify. When we talk about vulnerability in the context of disaster risk reduction, if you want to talk about vulnerability in other areas, then, then you might be able to bring your donkey in. But otherwise, asses stay outside. We look at vulnerability in a human context, okay? So as it applies to humans, all right? So that's hence the focus on human agency as opposed to everybody's agency. We are not studying the vulnerability of those dogs and those cows or these donkeys when we talk about it. Um, yes, it is important and obviously, you know, the environmental conservationists, you know, the, bio, the, the life of this particular rainforest is vulnerable to, but okay, that, that's not actually in our function in, in when we're looking at disaster risk reduction, okay? That's, that's a conservation matter. So we need to focus on vulnerability in the context of humans. Now within that, we have three considerations. We need to consider exposure. Okay. Now notice it doesn't say, I'm not sure if you've actually had this lesson, if it's been brought up to you. Um, does this equation look in any way familiar? Has anyone seen that before? Ah, okay, consider yourself now ahead of the game. 
Somebody somewhere in this course is going to ask me what that is. All right? And this is the fundamental equation that you need to know if you are going to work in the field of disaster risk reduction. All right? This is, this is going to be, you're going to have, like, when we all leave here, I actually seriously thought about getting this as a tattoo, but then my kid thought it was a little weird, and he was like, but who is R? And I'm like, see, Clayton, that, that's you, honey. That's, that's, <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, but this is a fundamental equation. And ultimately, what it, what it does is it explains what risk is. Again, we're here studying disaster risk. Okay? So this is risk. Okay? That's what the R is. Guess for the H. See, you guys are picking up. Well, give us a few hours and we're, we're all through it right here. This is somebody, somebody who was messing with me when they decided to have a 9 o'clock class. When I went to university, they, um, gosh, that sounds, sounds like one of those stories that old people tell you, like, way back in the day when I went to university. It wasn't that long ago, really. That... For some reason, it's like all the first year classes were at eight o'clock in the morning. Now, luckily I lived on campus, so theoretically that shouldn't have been a big deal. It's not like I had to drive across town through traffic. But when I got to uni, like I was there and it was just like, you know, class is at, was at eight. You should technically get up at seven and shower and brush your teeth and do your hair and get dressed and put on makeup. And then, so that happened like the first day and I was like falling asleep on the desk. Had no idea what they said. Then it became, I missed a few classes, then I felt guilty because I was missing a few classes. So then it became the priority. Get to the class. It doesn't matter what you look like when you get there. <laughs> In Jamaica, our culture is very much, um, you know, the hair, the, the dress, the shoes, the whole outfit. Rolled out of bed in flannel pajamas strapped a bag on my back, ran across campus. Sometimes I had shoes on, depended on how my day went. And, but I made it to the class. And a lot of those people with really nice hair, so I, I, I was able to sit in the exam with a smile on my face. And everybody realized that um, I was born in Canada, so the flannel thing, so it was okay. They're like, it's okay, you can wear those. <laughs> you, nobody else can, but she can get away. Anyway, um, so yes, the fact that they decided to have a 9 o'clock class, which is really is kind of the same as an 8 o'clock class. It's like, I'm sorry, guys. Yes. But it's okay, because I think Crystal, who might teach the next class, is a person. That's, why, that's probably why she has the 10 o'clock class. Anyway, and then the last one is capacity. Please also be informed that while I am teaching these things, you're going to have bizarre and useless knowledge that comes up and really strange stories. And I just wanted to clarify something um, because, yeah, it, it just, I just, I thought it was really important that um, despite, despite um, our popular um, misconceptions, um, marijuana is not legal in Jamaica. <laughs> and I don't use, I mean, it's, it's not legal to smoke marijuana, okay? If a policeman finds you, this might be on the exam, you never know. I'll just throw it in just for part of this But But if a policeman finds you with, say, two slips in your pocket, they won't say anything. If they find you with three slips in your pocket, it means that you're going to sell it, so they'll arrest you for trafficking. But it is illegal. That said, however, that marijuana is a plant. Marijuana grows wild. So if you came to our house tomorrow, don't be surprised if you wandered through our backyard and you just see it growing wild. <laughs> just, but but it's not it's not it's not legal. So it's technically you know not everybody is smoking all the time. Um, and just to clarify, I've never smoked marijuana. <laughs> um, but it's funny because. There, a lot of people actually, it's not even necessarily smoking. People drink it. We have a friend, my father had cataracts and glaucoma. 
and we had a friend who was the police chief. So this day he comes over with his bottle and he says, no, that my father must take this. What is it? He says, no, you must take this, take the liquid, this big monk of guff in this container. You must take the liquid, we're very into traditional language. And he must rub this stuff on his eyes morning and night until it's finished. So it opens the bottle and you know, knock back with the smell. That apparently, now this is the police chief. Apparently, soap marijuana in overproof white rum. And if you can avoid not drinking it, um, if you rub it on your eyes, apparently it helps with cataracts and glaucoma. But and if you if you boil it and you drink it, my mother is asthmatic, so the same police chief decided to fix my mom's asthma and boiled it and mixed it with a thing called Irish mist and some syrup. My mother was pretty much asthma attack free for three months until she realized what was in the bottle and then she refused to drink it anymore. Yes, yeah, so technically it is illegal. So we're not all sitting smoking because perhaps if we were my, my master's dissertation would have been such a lot of that. I would have had much more exciting insights in it. Anyway, they should use this piece of information for today. Getting back to our, our equation. This is gonna be the one thing that you need to know and understand inside out, okay? Uh, it goes back to, it wasn't just a random thing, it goes back to the definition and what we're looking at, exposure, exposure to certain things, okay? And when we look at here, when we talk about exposure, it's normally within the context of, for the most part, um, a hazard, okay? So the more specific, this equation, the more specific you are, the, the better the results you're going to get, okay? The, tell me the risk for the entire population of the world to hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes, and landslides. Now, today. If I asked you that, that result is gonna be so broad and so big, it's really not gonna do anything to help you. Versus now, and this we're going back, the more focused you are. Focus on vulnerability. We're looking, say, a particular, a group. Again, more focused on human agency and what have you. All right, so we're going to look at the Kosa people in Eastern Cape in the Labla community um, to flooding, coastal flooding, and then their capacity. That uh, there was a program 10 years ago that taught all of the women how to swim. Okay, the results, the risk analysis that you're going to be able to get out of that is going to be much more accurate. Okay? So when we talk about vulnerability, though, we need to, in assessing that, we need to consider what the exposure is. Is there exposure? If you are not, um, we look at Potosterum. I'm also going to bring in weird worldly, worldly examples. Um, you're going to know more about Jamaica when you finish this course in Canada than you ever really needed to know, and you probably will never actually need to know. But just for contrast. Here in Pakistan, the first question I get, why on earth are you here? You left Jamaica to come here and study disasters. What disasters do we have? Okay. For all of you who are born and raised Pakistanis, please raise your hand when you're familiar with incidents as we go along, okay? Have you had a tsunami? Earthquake? Storm surge? Coastal flooding? Riverine flooding, it's like river floods. Yeah. Volcano. <laughs> Mass movement. Yeah. Okay. Um, now from the perspective of uh, Jamaica. Earthquake, yes. We're right next to Haiti. When it shook the other day, we are, are slush. Um, we are in the hurricane belt. We get hurricanes, tropical storms, which contribute to storm surges. So basically you get, it's not a tsunami, but it's just a huge influx of water that comes in and basically floods everybody that lives on the coast. Uh, we have, uh, where we are in terms of the island chain, we are near Kikum Jenny, which is the volcano that is in Montserrat, which sometimes when it explodes, we end up getting ash all over our cars and everything else. Okay, we're a few hours away from that. Um, 
we've had recently some tornadoes, which have been quite new. Good job, climate change. Um, we have pretty much, if you can think about it, with the exception of avalanches, we have mass movement, we've got flooding, we've, you name it, we've got it. So the exposure of somebody in Potters Broom to hurricanes is significantly less than somebody living in Jamaica. Okay. When we go into disaster risk assessments, though, we're also going to talk about, well, if I asked you that, if I said to you, tell me the risk profile, the exposure of somebody in Jamaica in January to hurricanes versus in July, even that will give you a different result because we have hurricane season. Okay? So in the risk assessment section, we're going to talk about how exposure, even within the context, it can be within the context of a year, it can be within the context of a season, can be within the context of even within a week. Okay, people talk about crime. When are you more exposed to crime? Payday, Christmas, weekends, versus on you actually technically may be less exposed to the risk of violent crime on a Monday than you are on a Friday night. Okay, just something to keep in mind. So exposure changes as well. Also, your sensitivity. Again, goes back to kind of some of the basic things we've talked about. Um, when you look at sensitivity, do you have access to resources? Do you have insurance that's paid up? Do you have safeguards in place? Do you have savings? Something as simple as having savings in your bank. Okay? It makes a difference. You may not have a million rand, but having 10,000 is better than having and then, again, resilience is actually considered with invulnerability. Okay? So going back to the previous slide, you need to consider the ability to absorb shock, bounce back, and the ability to adapt and learn. Okay? Which is sometimes why the assumption is, is that older people are more vulnerable than younger people. Why? Because the assumption is, is that Younger people are more willing to learn. I don't know, I've met some very stubborn young people, and I wouldn't be willing to challenge that. I've got an 11 year old son at home, and he is not necessarily the most eager to change behavior. So I think sometimes experience works in your favor with age. Okay? Anyway, so those are the things that need to be considered. Now, looking back to this equation, however, when we talk about risk, we use this as a model for actually going out and determining now what needs to be the focus. So not only are we looking at when we do an assessment, we use this model to determine what the hazards are, what the vulnerability is, and what the capacity is. But we also use that as a way of making recommendations for remedies. If you realize there is no capacity in the community, that could be your starting point. You need to build capacity perhaps uh, teaching people how to swim, uh, getting people to learn how to read. Okay, if you don't know where the sign is that says exit because they can't read, literacy could be a very big issue. Um, so certain skills, okay, being, teaching people how to put out fires, how to channel water, okay. A lot of times what they'll do is just to, you know, they'll see water coming, but you know if you dig a ditch, how that works and how that can actually help save your home. Okay? So this is something that's going to come up a million and one times and just to understand the interplay between the concepts and that risk is a function of all of these. Okay? Uh, all right. Um, resilience versus vulnerability. Again, just to compare, we look at resilience from a systematic approach just by the nature of what we're looking at. That's how it comes up. Okay, you look at social, you can look at ecological, and you can look at geophysical systems. So for our mad scientists on this side of the room, you obviously, you've got a place for don't. It's okay. I came, I, I came into this field, um, when I came to South Africa, I came into this, this field with a very different background than most people. If you notice during the introductions of the staff and the other lecturers, um, there's a strong background in communications in our, in our particular unit. Um, Diavol has a background in public administration. Um, 
Leandri has environmental, is it environmental management as well. Um, but most of the people kind of come in with either geography and environmental management, or they have a, a full background, first degree, second degree kind of thing, third degree public management, or communications all the way up. Um, sadly, I have a little bit of an attention issue, which if you haven't noticed it already, that, um, so my first degree was actually in public administration and international relations. My second degree is in environmental management and focusing on disaster studies. And then, so I kind of have, I've got the admin section, I've got the communications to the international relations, and I've got the environmental side, so the physical sciences. And in our faculty, we actually have to do physical sciences. So um, I kind of stand, where each, each of the other staff members kind of has their positivist, constructivist approaches. You're either, you're either on the sciencey side or you're on the, the art side. I kind of stand straddle right in the middle. Both of, I see the value of both, okay? And I at least can explain both to a certain extent. So um, I see, and that's why I think it's really important that you cannot just do just a science-based assessment and you can't do just a kind of a, hum a humanities-based analysis, that you need both to complement each other. Okay? And looking at, within resilience, the interaction of multiple agents, okay, and the relationships between them. It is not just that group, whereas vulnerability does tend primarily to focus on a certain group and then kind of go from there, right? Uh, again, Vulnerability, the unit of analysis is human or environmental systems. Anyway. Um, and, and social groups or livelihoods, okay, or sectors. So it's, it's very, very much based on human systems, okay, focused on particular actors. Da, 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 da. Um, we're, looking at, we're looking at processes. We want to know certain processes and how they come into play, okay, social, political, economic. We are not so much interested in biophysical and ecological. That's not really the priority. Okay? Um, we are very much interested, though, in historical and political economic processes. Okay? How did people end up being poor? What was the... How, how did residents in Kuma end up in the situation that they're in? They, most of the people in that area came, uh, especially the people that were not originally from the province, came up from uh, Eastern Cape. And then they came up and a lot of them, the men in particular, got jobs in the mines. Now, over the past few decades, there has been major, major closes in the mines. So you had, say, say 2,000 people spread across four mines. Then there was three mines. Then there was two mines. Then there's now one mine. And all of these people now, if they didn't get into the next mine, or the next mine, or the next mine, then they ended up being in a situation where they may not have jobs. But they not in a position necessarily to go back. Looking at some of the social dynamics even within that community, so one of my master's students is looking at. Looking at particular family structures. A lot of the men that came up, they were in situations where they were in relationships, traditionally married to women, and particularly most of them, or some of them had families in Eastern Cape. So it wasn't a situation where the whole family came up, it was a situation where the men came up to work. So now in the limits in terms of finances and so on, a lot of those families stayed behind. However, things happen, and next thing now, the, the situations up here, there are, say, girlfriends, unofficial women in their lives, perhaps. Um, and then they have second families, all right? So now you've got one person that has theoretically responsibilities over two families. So it stretches resources even further. Okay? So looking at some of those dynamics, so looking at how the economy of that area, how that drove the migration of certain mine workers from across the country, okay? Also brought people in from Swaziland and some of the other surrounding countries to bring them in as migrant workers. 
think. Um, Aish. It's interesting, we're gonna get into it a lot further down, but it's really interesting when you sit and you talk about um, some of the, the dynamics. We're gonna talk about a little bit later, um, who's vulnerable? Mentioned, it's, it's come up, it's been, well, the poor, the rich, the whatever, but I wanna, based on perceptions, who is vulnerable? Look around this room, and somebody remind me before the end of the class, if I forget. Who is vulnerable in this room? Who is the most vulnerable? <laughs> all right. Would you not say that you're the most experienced? That all these other people are completely inexperienced young people? I'm very vulnerable to that. The <laughs> okay, all right. Why are you the most vulnerable? <laughs> of which country? <laughs> it can't be any worse than what we've got already, so that's okay. I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay, who else? Who else is vulnerable in here? Doesn't have to be you, you can point at someone else. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's all well and good to say, you know, money isn't a big deal. It, it's very easy to say that, oh, you know, it's, I'm religious, I'm this, I'm that. I don't, you know, money, uh, it's, it's just things. Now, if I asked you to give up your car, to give up your air conditioning, to give up your cell phone, All right? To live in a shack and find your way to the campus every day. How does that change your life? <laughs> well, having the experience of being in Jamaica, um, I insisted when I came here that that was one of the things that I needed to do. And wow, you get some interesting looks when people see you inside of the shack. And it's like, I had more people, I've had people even carrying my bags to the, the gate um, where I would get, you know, and so we'd get out, half the taxi would come with me with my bags, out of my, oh, such great service here, and Jamaica would be like, just get yourself out, like, move already, you know, and hurry up to get people to, to drop off. So, but, I mean, things like that. 
things that you would have to learn. You would have to develop different capacities to survive in a different situation. The same way now, if it was reversed, you now have to learn how to access technology. People come from areas where they don't have access to these things. You drop them in a city. How do you pay public transportation? How do you open bank accounts? How do you use a cell phone? How do you get credit for a cell phone? Best thing was teaching my mother how to use a cell phone. The best thing in my whole life, just the joy of just seeing her. You know, you know, you switch the, the, the role, like my mother's always, you know, it's a mother. Your mother tells you what to do and teaches you when you were a little kid. Now it's, okay, mom, this is the phone. You have to plug it in to charge it. Every few days, it shows you the battery. And we have prefix, so it's, you must take this number and hit this button and that button and, the, and it's like, no, my gosh, I don't have it. What are you doing? I don't understand. It's like, it's like, it's, like, it's okay. If it makes you feel better, my mother, uh, she's got herself an iPad and she has learned how to Skype. She, because, because she wants, she is, she has learned how to Skype so she can talk to her grandson and so she can see the, the, the next arrival. But she, she insisted she had to do that. And she sat there. I said, God, I'm so glad I wasn't in the room for that. They probably need my attention issue. I probably would have jumped out the window by then. It was bad enough with the phone, but alone. And you turn the iPad on. So, um, yeah, getting back to why certain people are vulnerable. Each of us has a perception. In a certain context, we all. Each of us have a certain perception of what vulnerability means to us and how we feel. Okay? So we need to look at certain contexts and we need to understand that. And we look at, again, the historical and the political and the economic um, processes. We also look at certain stresses. We look at our interests. We look at values. We look at knowledge, the agency of actors. We look at issues of power. Who is the majority in this country? You automatically went to race. You automatically went to race. Why was that? Why didn't you say perhaps Christians? or men, or adults, or between a certain, yeah, between a certain group, right? So perceptions of power, power in a certain context. There are certain places, hey guys, there are certain places that I don't want to necessarily be, I don't want to necessarily be white in this context. There's certain places that I don't want to be black in another context, right? Because it changes how I perceive vulnerability changes in that in that particular context. Most of them, yeah. But then don't make the assumption because there actually are quite a lot of poor white people. And since I've moved to Poch, there have been a lot more white people begging at intersections, which I think is interesting. That suddenly now you will see people. Go to children's homes. There's a lot of children, white children, in children's homes. Culturally, it's the, uh, the process of giving up a child for adoption, willingly, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's not as common. That more people, um, in black communities, you're more likely to, if I can't raise my child, then my sister will raise it, or my cousin or someone. Right? Just one of those weird observations. Okay. We also look at access, access to resources. I'll tell you why I feel that in this room, maybe I'm the most vulnerable. Up until, up until today, at this very moment, I, I'm in an in interesting situation. Because technically I'm here, but I am not actually employed. Because I am a, ultimately, I am a migrant worker. Do I look like a migrant worker? Ran across the border? Well, I couldn't have run because you know, you'd have to take a boat. <laughs> but ultimately, I am, an, I am a migrant worker. 
Okay, I have come here from another country. I do not have voting rights in this country. I do not have necessarily certain say. Okay, I am in this country up until this point to study. And if the folk decided that we do not want you here, it means I would have to leave immediately. Okay, I am actually here now. Um, I, I guess technically it would have been but now I am here on a spousal work permit, but I legally do not have a contract yet. So I am, I am here at nine o'clock in the morning with the joy of being with you, because I'm not getting paid for this, right? So, but ultimately, being here, if my husband, I am going to because as a well-educated, liberal woman, if my husband got up and decided to divorce me in the morning, because of the nature of the permit that I am on, I would be deported. Because legally, I'm only able to work because I am married to a wife. That I actually just found out the other day. That because I was on a research permit up to this point, Legally, I am still not eligible for permanent residence. If I was on a work permit for the last five years, I would have applied. But technically, I'm not. However, I have been told that, again, if I, if I can make it technically, I guess until this baby is born, I can, I can apply for permanent residence based on relatives. <laughs> but because I'm not working, so technically. Anyway, so and being female, and being a racial minority, and physically being pregnant, and being slightly, slightly older than twenty-one, puts me slightly. Just, we're talking a, few, a matter of a few hours, really. <laughs> but basically, I could argue that I, at any given point, I could be thrown out of this country. Kind of love it. It's okay. It's okay. Anyway, so just to show some of the things, my access to resources is very limited. I, under the law, I have to be here on my own medical because I cannot go to a public hospital. I cannot access unemployment if I lose my job, okay? Or, well, technically I don't have a job to lose, so. <laughs> Theoretically, it's realistically, it's, uh, it's, and it takes what, I think now nearly two years to get um, permanent residence. So until that comes through, I'm still, I am, I am still personally on in this country, so. If you have any complaints about me, it's okay. Just, you can bring them back to, to my, not, my, imaginary, my imaginary boss, I guess, because he's not really official, and, and complain. And if you don't really like your mark or anything, you can actually, it's, it's not a matter of getting me fired. It's a matter of, you can send me packing. In which case, I, you will, Dolly, you can, if you want to speak to me again, you can speak to Dolly. Well, who will be Prime Minister of Jamaica, and she will be able to find me sitting amongst my garden full of marijuana, raising my child with my new Rasta husband, because my husband probably wouldn't come with me. So in case you need me, I'll be there on the beach, monitoring hurricanes. Yes, why am I here again? Anyway. All right, last point before we wrap up, since we're gone over time, is looking at what's actually happening in practice. And in practice, resilience in particular is not as, it's not as obvious as looking at and applying vulnerability, okay? Particularly in the context of policy applications, okay? Resilience is not really documented very often. And there is the need for specific intervention points. If I said to you in the morning, your assignment for this week is going to be to show me resilience. I need you to make resilience happen. There isn't a 
cut and fast procedure. There isn't a guideline there that says, this is what it looks like, because again, the concepts are fuzzy. This is what it looks like, and this is, this is what you do. These are the steps that you take to make that happen. Okay, so since there's not necessarily guidelines for practitioners, since they're not necessarily guidelines, it means that we don't know what it looks like and we're not necessarily able to make that happen. Okay? And also to provide positive and negative outcomes. Okay? We don't necessarily... It's to be able to say what is right and what is wrong. It kind of actually goes back to the threshold com uh, conversation that we had. And, well, what, is, what does good look like? If you've achieved resilience, it should look like it shouldn't look like, all right? So in practice, this is what we're struggling with, okay? And vulnerability, a lot of times how we see vulnerability, most of the practitioners will probably notice, it's seen in a negative light, okay? What's going wrong? People are not literate. People are not able to do ABC, okay? They have no access to, they have no citizenship, they are of a minority, religion or race or what have you, okay? Um, however, vulnerability is, a little more obvious, a little more predominant than in uh, comparing it to resilience. And that there is the link, um, a little more of an obvious link between research and actual policy and practice. We tend to see vulnerability more so, more obvious in terms of disaster risk reduction, studying livelihoods, looking at food insecurity and climate change adaptation. Okay. So it's, it's easier, there, again, there's no there's no little drawing that I can say, this is what it looks like. But it's easier for people to give you um, a description of characteristics if I said, what does vulnerability look like, than when I say, what does resilience look like. And again, because of context changes and all of these factors that we discussed. Okay? All right. That is it. And I've gone over time. Anybody have any questions? It is Resilience and Vulnerability, Complementary or Conflicting Concepts by...